Right, welcome to this IDS event, to all those who are in the room here at IDS, and also to all those who are joining us online. My name is Peter Taylor. I'm Director of Research here at IDS, and I have the great pleasure of hosting this lecture today and the discussion that's going to follow. And I must say as well that uh, this is now following on from a really excellent conversation that we've also just been having over the last couple of hours. So I can almost guarantee that this is going to be a, a really exciting session. We're greatly honored to welcome to IDS today, His Excellency Antonio Patriota, the ambassador of Brazil to the United Kingdom. And we're delighted he's going to share with us today his insights into Brazil's vision for tackling press pressing global development, climate and environmental challenges in the year that Brazil is the presidency holder of the G20. Before we start, a few quick housekeeping points. The closed captions facility is available on Zoom. We're not expecting a fire drill this evening, although one never knows. If you do hear the alarm, please leave the building by the side exit at the back of the room over there. This event is being held as part of the IDS Brazil Initiative and the Brazil in the World event series. And importantly for everyone who's here in the room and also online, we should have plenty of time for questions and answers. So those online, please put any questions you'd like to ask in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And of course, in the room, we'll have a roving mic. As a bit of context for today's lecture, the return of Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva to the Brazilian presidency and his announcement that Brazil is back has met with much expectation worldwide. And added to this, Brazil is a key focus for global policy engagement due to its role in leading the G20. And also, of course, as the upcoming host of the UN Climate Summit COP30 in 2025. And we're especially pleased to host this lecture today because IDS, as an institute, are involved in a number of key ways with the Think Tank Engagement Group, otherwise known as the T20, which is uh, a lot, part of a larger number of national foreign think tanks, where the Brazilian government is really encouraging the participation of academics and other international actors from amongst the G20 members and beyond. And I think it's the openness that we've experienced from the government of Brazil and the G20 presidency to policy and implementation proposals that's really encouraging to see how uh, the government of Brazil is really encouraging and promoting dialogue, debate and mutual learning around some of the biggest issues, most challenging issues that we all face uh, in the world today. And this lecture today and the discussion that follows are of course a part of this ongoing dialogue. So I'd like to briefly introduce our speaker for today's lecture. His Excellency Antonio Patriota has been ambassador of Brazil to the UK uh, United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland since August 2023. He's also served as Foreign Minister and Deputy Foreign Minister, and he's had a number of high-level diplomatic roles over quite a number of years as Ambassador of Brazil to Egypt, to Italy, to the US, as well as Permanent Representative of Brazil to the United Nations. And I think it's for us, uh, it's very valuable to know also that during his period as Ambassador to the UN, His Excellency was the Chairman of the 60th and 61st Sessions of the Commission on the Status of Women and Chairman of the Peacebuilding Commission of the UN. And he's also a member of the Leaders for Peace Initiative under the chairmanship of former French Prime Minister Jean-Pierre Raffarin. So I think these, uh, this experience, which we've also just been hearing about and the insights and the personal uh, mm -hmm. stories, I'm sure are going to be extremely interesting as we hear your presentation today, Ambassador. You're very welcome. Uh, we're really delighted you've been able to give us so much of your time today. And now we're looking forward to your lecture. The Thank floor you is much. yours. Thank you. So I need to. No longer on mute? No. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Professor Peter Taylor, and also Elisa Leach for the warm welcome today. Um, I can assure you that this is part of the most enjoyable tasks that I have, <laughs> more enjoyable tasks that I have as ambassador engaging with young people. And in my case, to engage with IDS also has a slightly sentimental uh, dimension because my son studied here for many years. He concluded his PhD about two years ago and uh, greatly enjoyed his time in this very cosmopolitan, international, and uh, very open um, institution uh, uh, that actually, I find, speaks the same language as the government I represent today because the emphasis is all on um, devising uh, the most effective policies for uh, reducing inequality, poverty, promoting development that is sustainable, environmentally responsible, and also democratic. 
um, and based on respect for the rule of law. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm certain that in, in addressing uh, uh, an audience such as uh, this here today uh, in Brighton, uh, I need not give uh, too much information about Brazil. You probably have uh, some uh, preliminary knowledge uh, that will um, uh, allow me to, to um, go more deeply into the recent uh, history uh, without having to uh, describe in, in any detail our geography, our population, our uh, culture. Um, I hope that some of you have listened to Brazilian music and have been a, in touch with uh, Brazilian culture, uh, in addition to perhaps having visited Brazil as well. Uh, but when, um, you know, uh, we mentioned Brazil is back, and this is something President Lula said when he was, uh, when he was elected, it's a, it's a sentence that is actually charged with meaning. It's charged with meaning um, in a number of ways uh, because President Lula represented in, during his first two terms from 2003 to 2010, already um, uh, to a certain degree, a silent revolution for Brazil. As you know, Brazil is a relatively uh, important economy among now Nowadays, it varies a little bit depending on the exchange rate, but uh, uh, currently 11th largest economy in the world, but um, famous for being very unequal for a country with a lot of concentration of wealth within a uh, small proportion of the population. And when I say a silent revolution, because not obvious for a country that um, was a monarchy for most of the 19th century and then ruled by... Um, very powerful economic groups uh, during the first half of the 20th century to elect a trade union leader uh, from the proletariat uh, with uh, only mm, secondary education. So uh, he only had any schooling, in, uh, pri primary schooling, and then technical education, had worked in a factory, and yet went on to be an extraordinarily effective leader um, because he uh, combined a number of characteristics that are not necessarily present in, in someone of, of his profile. At the same time, placing a lot of emphasis in social development and reducing poverty and hunger and uh, inequality, but uh, very open-minded, very democratic. Um, in fact, uh, very effective in dialogue with uh, the factory owners, with the uh, financial uh, system and, and uh, the banking uh, personalities in Brazil. Uh, also, um, someone who, uh, in spite of his, um, let's say, background, that, that was not a, an elite background, who had, um, from his very early career as a trade union leader, engaged internationally um, with a very strong interest in international relations. I, I uh, served as policy planning uh, responsible for policy planning within the foreign ministry during the first Lula administration and then under secretary for political affairs, I would always be surprised uh, in going with Lula to sometimes very distant locations like South Korea, the Republic of Korea, where he would have friends. He would say, oh, you know, I need to make uh, to to open a slot here in my agenda to meet with my friend, the uh, the steel workers union leader that I've known for many, many years. So he is truly somebody who is at ease um, in diplomacy and in connecting internationally in ways that I think were very unexpected for much of the Brazilian public. Um, we had had a, a, a former president, Cardozo, also um, extremely um, qualified and, and talented, uh, but from you know, uh, somebody with a PhD uh, who spoke several languages and who had been traveling all his life. So not surprisingly, he could engage well internationally. But I think Lula, in many ways was a surprise domestically, internationally, um, with his social conscience, but also democratic credentials and interest in international affairs. Now, um, this did not um, prevent Brazil from going into a problematic period uh, after uh, Lula's succession, uh, uh, a president from the same party, Dilma Rousseff, with whom I work closely, I was her foreign minister for almost three years um, from confronting a very strong opposition, uh, including uh, an impeachment process uh, in Congress that destituted her and 
uh, replaced her government with a government that was more conservative. At first, a government that did not represent uh, in itself a challenge to democracy, but subsequently with an election of Jair Bolsonaro. Yes, and now if some of you have been following the news uh, in the past week, there is evidence uh, that indeed uh, Mr. Bolsonaro plotted against uh, Brazilian democracy by trying to mm, uh, find ways of uh, delegitimizing uh, the election of his successor through contacts with the military and other contacts. I mean, fortunately, Brazil's institutions demonstrated resilience. Um, we have an electoral tribunal that has now declared Mr. Bolsonaro ineligible for ne the next two elections. And uh, the justice system is investigating um, these um, attacks on democracy that are unconstitutional against the law, obviously, in order to uh, make sure that such attempts do not take place again. So Brazil is back, uh, not only because um, a very experienced leader who um, reduced poverty and hunger in Brazil, um, established a much more ambitious foreign policy with 35 new embassies worldwide. It's a very strong commitment to multilateralism worldwide. Um, and um, um, also an ability for, for uh, domestic dialogue across ideological divides, um, a very inclusive uh, kind of leader. Uh, in part, Brazil is back because he is back, uh, President Lula. But I think also Brazil is back from a problematic experience um, and having survived these, um, these uh, difficult times uh, in a different world, of course, where the challenges are different. So the title that was given to me are Priorities for Tackling Global Challenges. And if there is one thing I can ascertain, I was, um, as uh, Professor Taylor was just saying, ambassador in Egypt before coming to the UK, so in that capacity, I received President Lula for the COP27 meeting at Sharm El Sheikh. Uh, I spent three full days talking with him, having lunch and dinner, uh, in addition with other, other people, of course. But I could witness firsthand his conversion, almost, I would say, to the idea that um, we must, in Brazil, um, adopt the most responsible behavior when it comes to the environment. Now, this is not only a function of um, the fact that the Amazon region or the majority of the Amazon region is in Brazil, but also um, uh, uh, the result of other, other circumstances. For example, the fact that within the G20 countries, and I will talk a little bit about the G G20 in a moment, um, we already have a kind of um, lead uh, in terms of uh, our energy matrix, which is the cleanest of the entire G20 group. Um, uh, to give you an idea, uh, about 45% of our energy matrix is um, made up of renewable sources of energy, whereas the world average is under 20%. So um, in many ways, uh, Brazil um, became environmentally aware uh, and um, introduced policies that favored uh, renewable sources of energy, for example, before it became fashionable. And this gives us also a certain uh, authority and credibility in defending. But then again, uh, there's a whole question of the rainforest and uh, the treatment that uh, has been given by different administrations to this, um, uh, let's say, uh, capital, uh, or uh, um, in French, you would say patrimoine, um, that, that Brazil uh, has inherited uh, in its territory. And that is of importance not only for Brazil, but for the world as well. I think there's another reasoning here that also should apply, which is the following. Uh, no matter how virtuous Brazil behaves in terms of protecting the forest, uh, combating illegal deforestation, reducing or uh, achieving zero deforestation, the Amazon will still be under threat due to global um, greenhouse gas emissions by the rest of the international community. There could be a tipping point that has nothing to do with Brazilian policy or attitudes, but are actually the consequence of irresponsible behavior elsewhere. So in this respect, I think we're very much in a, in a situation that as sometimes I, I summarize as uh, there is no salvation without cooperation. Um, we're all in the same boat, in, in other words. Um, Brazil is back, Lula is back, um, with this very strong commitment 
to three important causes, um, which I would summarize as democracy, sustainability, and peace. And I think in today's world, uh, there's a deficit of leadership in each one of these uh, aspects. So the fact that um, a country uh, today in the world can, can embody these, these three civilizational causes is, is something that is of value. And of course, I, I'm not arguing that um, uh, only Brazil uh, is, is capable of, of leading the way. And, and, and indeed, Brazil um, has its limitations um, and will not achieve uh, much that is significant on its own. So hence, the importance of reaching out um, uh, within the region, globally, within the multilateral system, um, including with the United Kingdom. And uh, of course, not only uh, intergovernmentally, but also with academia, with civil society, uh, with um, different uh, groups. Um, when we look at global challenges, um, uh, many of them are very clear to, to everyone, but uh, I think I, I will concentrate um, on uh, three aspects that have inspired the priorities that we will uh, uh, be identifying during our presidency of the G20. Uh, so one of them is hunger and poverty and inequality. If you look at President Lula's speech um, uh, at the 78th General Assembly of the United Nations, uh, the central theme is inequality. And the reason is inequality has been increasing within countries, among countries. And inequality is the enemy of sustainable development. It is also um, often the enemy of democracy. Uh, it generates um, tensions socially and um, elected governments that are not capable of delivering improved livelihood for the majority of the population. They are um, subject to criticism for, for understandable reasons, but also they open the gateway for undemocratic um, platforms that I think should be of concern. So the many fold um, ramifications of inequality uh, should really kind of raise the, the level of alarm internationally as to what is uh, happening uh, before our eyes. I think here in the UK, uh, an NGO like Oxfam has been studying this phenomenon and producing some quite alarming uh, results. Now, when you look at inequality, um, we need to uh, learn from uh, experiences and um, policies that have produced uh, positive results. Uh, you also need to look at the most vulnerable groups. So in this respect, we need not start from zero or invent the wheel because there are platforms such as the Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals that already provide a kind of orientation um, for eradication of hunger and poverty, gender equality, uh, improved sanitation, infrastructure, uh, energy use, uh, and while well, you are uh, familiar with the 17 goals, I need not go over them. And the beauty also of the 2030 agenda is that it is applicable universally. So um, it, it starts from the uh, assumption that um, in this respect, uh, no country has uh, achieved a kind of uh, status where it need not look at uh, its domestic situation or uh, where it need not mm, maybe benefit from other experiences. Hence, uh, a priority I, uh, that I believe uh, is one that um, every government should, should heed very, very carefully is that of reducing inequality. Uh, reminding ourselves also that often uh, the most vulnerable within our societies are uh, the rural workers uh, so the agricultural sector, with that, within the rural sector, the female uh, population or the, the older population, as well as the uh, childhood. So a task force um, has been uh, identified as one of the priorities within the G20 presidency precisely to deal with this issue. And I'm very gratified that IDS is a... Um, an institution that has been studying inequality and uh, inequity uh, and looking at um, you know, comparative situations around the world precisely in order to learn lessons and to promote policies that can make and can have um, a positive impact. Um, another obvious challenge is the one of global warming. Um, 
I mentioned no salvation without cooperation. Cooperation has begun. It exists within the multilateral system. I think the Paris Agreement was an important landmark. Is it sufficient? Is it delivering the results we would like to see? I don't believe it is. So um, this is another area where we need to look carefully at the gaps and uh, try to address them uh, with a sense of responsibility, not only towards the existing uh, world population, but also towards future generations. And within this uh, topic of sustainability, let's say, um, in order to use a broader category that includes the three pillars of economic, social, and environmental progress, uh, one big challenge that uh, Brazil will be focusing also within the G20 is that of providing adequate finance um, within a perspective of climate justice. So as you're well aware, um, entire continents that contribute uh, very marginally towards uh, uh, the emission of greenhouse gases uh, and to global warming, like Africa, are paying a very high price in terms of extreme weather episodes, uh, droughts, uh, rains, and flooding. Uh, Africa, I believe, contributes about 4% uh, to global warming. And yet it has scarce resources. The countries are highly indebted. The countries are also often at war. Um, so I'll, I'll go into uh, this entire uh, debate about the interlinkages between uh, peace and sustainability. Um, I think it's very difficult to talk about sustainability at all unless you have a minimally stable uh, political uh, situation. How can you address sustainability in Gaza today, for example? I mean, the entire environment is being destroyed. Um, and the third priority that Brazil is um, focusing on as G20 president is the improvement in international governance. Now, I think there's a widespread recognition that um, the multilateral system is not working adequately. Um, it, I think, is not entirely dysfunctional. And in fact, I often disagree with those who say, oh, you know, uh, it, it, it doesn't serve its purpose. Um, uh, we need to, to uh, start from scratch and begin again, because this is very dangerous. I think there's some important achievements that have been obtained through the multilateral system as it exists that need to be preserved. Um, sometimes I compare uh, the fact um, that a degree of dysfunctionality has entered into the international system to that of domestic politics so or domestic um, rules uh, and, uh, and laws. Uh, so in, in a very simple comparison, it's not because um, people don't, don't observe or don't respect traffic lights that you're going to do away with the traffic lights. So similarly, it's not because there are violations uh, of uh, the UN Charter regarding territorial integrity, the use of force, et cetera, that you're going to do away with these laws. On the contrary, what I think we need to do is to generate um, a higher degree of indignation and the stronger political coalitions internationally uh, of, of countries, individuals, institutions, parliamentarians, um, NGOs, who really demand respect for international law by all in a non-selective way, because something that's very corrosive of the international order is um, the idea of double standards. Okay, I, I condemn uh, violations of international law when uh, the violator is A, B, or C, but you know I tolerate it when it's a friend of mine or an ally uh, or a country with whom I have good uh, relationship. But notwithstanding this crisis um, in the credibility of the system, and I could go into the WTO or the IFIs, the WTO, for example, um, being paralyzed in its dispute settlement uh, mechanisms due to the behavior of certain powerful countries, the IFIs very oligarchic in their behavior and uh, sometimes, let's say, uh, systemically more attuned to the needs of the more developed countries rather than uh, favoring additional resources for the highly indebted or those who, who pay a, a high price in terms of climate injustice. Um, the, the important also point to highlight is that um, there is a growing awareness that we need to reform. And uh, if we don't reform, we run the risk of really um, going down a very problematic and negative spiral. 
Uh, how do we know that there, this awareness exists? I think this UN Secretary General has taken an important lead when he has convened a summit of the future uh, for this year in September. So the summit of the future is an opportunity um, for looking at what works, um, trying to remedy mm, what is um, functioning unsatisfactorily or what is obsolete, uh, and also looking at new areas uh, where we don't yet have disciplines, rights and obligations have not been uh, well determined, and you need processes in order to prevent a kind of um, uh, free competition that would be very detrimental to cooperation and world peace in general. So um, I can give an example of uh, um, aspects of the existing system that I think we should not do away with. So one of them are the limitations on the use of force, for example, uh, within the UN Charter that should only be authorized if uh, if uh, given a green light by the UN Security Council or in legitimate self-defense. I think these are pillars of the international system that need to be preserved because the alternative would be uh, creating loopholes that would um, generate a situation of you know, the powerful can do what they want. And we, of course, do not want to enter into that kind of environment. Having uh, lived since the end of World War II within an environment where this is considered unacceptable, of course. Um, but then there are many things that need to be um, remedied or, or amended. Uh, the UN Charter, for example, has enemy clauses that identifies Germany and Japan as the enemy states. This is something obsolete. There are entire bodies that don't function anymore. The Trusteeship Council has not been functioning for years. Or the Military Staff Committee, which was conceived initially after World War II as a body where the main um, uh, powers uh, would place uh, troops and, uh, and uh, military facilities at the service of the, of the UN. This has never taken place. So we can do away with all that. But I think there's a consensus also, and there has been one since the 1990s, that you need a more representative uh, UN Security Council, which currently has 15 members. Um, when the UN was created, there were 50 countries uh, that signed the charter in San Francisco between 50 and 60. So the UN Security Council is composed of 11 uh, members. Um, subsequently, when the membership uh, doubled to about 100 and between 100 and 110, uh, the non-permanent membership went up um, from six to 10. So Security Council uh, was, was expanded from 11 to 15. What has happened since is that the membership has gone from 110 to 193. And yet the Security Council is the same size with the same permanent members clearly not discharging itself of its role uh, with mm, multiple manifestations of parochial um, attitudes being taken ra rather than uh, leadership positions that uh, lead uh, the organization in the direction of promoting international peace and security. So this is clearly one area where there has been a consensus since the 1990s that uh, reform and expansion are needed but it has been a challenge to find the exact formula that will work and what countries to incorporate and what capacity uh, within what uh, which met methods. And then we have the entire untapped territory of artificial intelligence, uh, cybersecurity, um, the, the advanced technologies where um, the international community is still struggling to to look into what are the parameters for um, limiting uh, the behavior of states. But here again, uh, maybe we're entering a territory that is um, to some degree new uh, to the extent that not only states are important actors, but some companies that detain uh, the knowledge uh, will also be ha have to be part of the conversation. At the same time, I think we really need to guard against um, discriminatory or exclusive clubs that will establish um, uh, unwanted borders between the haves and the have-nots in terms of technology. We don't want a new non-proliferation treaty for uh, digital technologies where essentially what was created was a, a freeze between those countries that had nuclear technology and those who didn't. 
Um, and then what happened is that non-proliferation of nuclear energy became the focus, but uh, non-proliferation non horizontally, whereas vertical proliferation, uh, increase in stockpiles and development of stockpiles uh, continued unabated. These are some of the ideas that we consider important for discussion um, at this year's uh, G20. And I'd like to introduce here a note about Brazil-UK relations and, uh, and the T20, uh, for which IDS is the focal point in Great Britain and um, uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, um, and IDS is now a part of the International Council um, of Think Tanks. I believe that this is an extraordinary opportunity really to tap into the creativity, the imagination, the know-how, um, the expertise that um, uh, institutions of excellence such as IDS produce um, and feed them into intergovernmental debates. You know, government officials um, can be extremely qualified um, uh, in terms of their knowledge, their experience, et cetera, but they will, uh, with, with exceptions here and there, not be uh, at the forefront of the academic debate on different uh, matters. And I think we we'll, can benefit greatly from inputs that are brought into um, discussions on how to create a more cooperative international environment. So, so this idea that the G20 should have a uh, auxiliary um, arm uh, that uh, taps into knowledge uh, accumulated and expertise um, um, made available uh, through institutions such as IDS is one that I find extremely useful. And th in this context, I would say um, that the United Kingdom is a country that um, is known internationally for the excellence of its universities and, and its academic institutions. So there's quite a bit that uh, that uh, the UK uh, can contribute, and even more so, I have to say, in, in respect of IDS, uh, an institution that very clearly is uh, quite aligned with the priorities that um, the Brazilian government currently uh, has identified uh, in looking at inequality and in looking at improved governance uh, domestically uh, to strengthen democratic rule and also internationally to improve. Uh, cooperation. So this is um, a very promising uh, situation. Um, I am also a strong believer in the role that the United Kingdom can play internationally uh, to improve um, international cooperation, um, be it South-South, be it through the multilateral system. Um, it's been a little bit disappointing that the UK reduced uh, the percentage of its GDP that was uh, initially, it, it used to get very good press among developing countries for reserving 0.7% of GDP for cooperation. And, and that uh, margin has been reduced. But at the same time, through my contacts with the FCDO uh, in London, I have uh, picked up a strong desire to engage internationally, um, trilaterally, for example, with two developing countries where the UK can provide some financial resources or some uh, know-how um, in, in um, a mutual learning uh, spirit, which is very much the spirit in which we had a conversation this afternoon that I greatly enjoyed. I learned quite a bit myself. And that is very much the um, subtext or the, um, um, if I may use this word, the ideology behind the 2030 agenda and the uh, sustainable development goals. I mean, from the moment when you um, recognize that every member of the international community um, has some progress to make um, in gender equality, in uh, eliminating poverty, uh, in uh, improving its infrastructure or, or its energy matrix, uh, you are in a more level playing field and in an environment where um, the exchange of knowledge should take place in a more um, equitable and democratic way rather than, you know, um, some countries believing that they, they have uh, the, the know-how or the, or the wisdom that needs to be transmitted in what I would describe as is become a, a uh, anachronistic colonial mentality. So um, I have identified this um, disposition within the, the UK 
government. And I think in, in this spirit, we would be uh, um, more than predisposed in, in collaborating uh, trilaterally uh, wherever possible. Uh, in Africa, I think Africa is a, is an important focus for Brazil and for the UK. President Lula will be in Addis Abeba uh, tomorrow uh, for the annual African Union meeting. And we will be opening an office of our International Cooperation Agency, which has relatively limited financial resources, but has some uh, important uh, experience in areas such as rural development, for example, that can be shared with um, countries that uh, are in the tropics with similar uh, climate and, and land conditions as we have in South America. Uh, so this is a very strong manifestation of a desire to engage um, also with the developing world in ways that are constructive. And I, I believe that um, it, the UK can be a very strong enabler of this kind of uh, cooperation. I look forward to some of your questions. I think um, um, I would conclude by saying that um, um, Brazil is a strong believer in diplomacy. Um, we uh, are um, very troubled uh, by the current international environment where um, an entirely disproportionate amount of resources, in our opinion, are being channeled to military uh, activity. Um, I don't know if you've seen the IISS report that came out last week signaling that the um, uh, weapons productions uh, in, in, and, and the, um, the budgets, military budgets in 2023 grew by 9% with respect to 2022. Uh, something President Lula says very often, and uh, of course this doesn't automatically um, make him uh, uh, obtain new friends in some powerful circles, but that, you know, all these wars, they end up profiting somebody. Um, and it is not the people uh, where the, the fighting is taking place. It's, uh, they are the deep pockets of the weapons producers, mostly in highly developed countries. So this is a very troubling development. And especially when you contrast that with the absence uh, or um, insufficient amount of resources for combating climate change, for reducing poverty, for improving the livelihood of people through education, health, sanitation, other very um, immediate concerns that would improve the livelihood of people around the world. So as, as a country that, that has invested quite a bit in, in diplomacy, um, I often uh, like to point out to the fact that Brazil is the third country in the world in number of land borders. So after Russia and China, uh, we would be the third with 10 neighbors. Uh, we have absolutely no border uh, dispute with any of these 10 neighbors because um, since more than 100 years, we have negotiated, we have uh, submitted to arbitration all our border issues. And this frees the government, has freed the government traditionally speaking, but I think this is, the awareness of this comparative advantage is more recent, uh, perhaps, uh, for engaging internationally in a non-hegemonic spirit. So what is our priority? Our priority is, of course, to improve the livelihood of the Brazilian population, to consolidate our democracy, uh, to mm, have a um, healthy uh, environment, to reduce uh, the loss of biodiversity and, and promote sustainable policies but also to engage internationally in ways that enhance cooperation and discourage, disincentivize uh, conflict and, uh, and war. So um, for us, engagement in the multilateral system is fundamental. Uh, the respect for international law is of the essence. And I think that in the current uh, context of global challenges uh, that we're all facing, we will not manage uh, to achieve results if we do not reestablish a strong commitment to respect for international law and international cooperation within existing mechanisms where applicable, but also developing new ones wherever possible. So thank you very much for your attention. And he hands them back to my chair. Yeah.
Great. Ambassador, thank you so much. I, I just felt as you were speaking over the last 40 minutes, the breadth and depth of the coverage that you just shared with us, I suspect is making many of those in the room today who are members of our student body uh, think that we might invite you to become one of our lecturers on a regular basis, because I think you've really, Who knows? <laughs> if your ambassadorial responsibilities ever give you time, it, it's really... I think, it, well, it's an insp inspirational um, take on the world for us. I think what's encouraging is that although you've laid out some some such significant challenges, hunger, inequality and poverty, global warming, climate change, and the need for improvement in international governance, you've also, I think, demonstrated ways in which we could imagine an alternative future. And I think, as we said earlier in the meeting that we had uh, earlier this afternoon, there's much to learn from Brazil's approach. And I, I think, as you said, over, over a very long period of time, a very conscious effort to develop relationships and to establish a means of, of engaging in the world. Uh, and now, now that Brazil is back, uh, it's renewing that presence mm. and I think offering many of us, uh, including here in the UK, opportunities to learn from uh, the approaches which are um, being taken by Brazil. And this year of G20, and the T20 that I guess is very privileged to be part of, I think is a really interesting and important moment for us to, to learn together, bring experience from different parts of the world together, mm -hmm. uh, to hear different voices, different perspectives, different, different experiences, um, to reimagine uh, development in the sense of what opportunities that brings for mm -hmm. every context, whether it's Brazil or the UK, or indeed many other countries around the world. And I particularly like your emphasis on intersections between those three pillars of democracy, sustainability, and peace, mm -hmm. which today are issues we're all concerned with and uh, struggling, I think, mm -hmm. to find ways forward to approach these challenges. So you've given us a wonderful, uh, inspirational talk, and I would like to open it up for questions. I'm sure there are many. Um, we have a room full of, uh, I'm sure, um, inquiring mm -hmm. minds and voices, and we'll just invite you to put your hand up uh, perhaps we could take three questions in the room, if that's okay, Ambassador, we'll of stimulate a few. And then also, uh, Gary, I think you may have some questions online, and perhaps we can invite a couple there too. So let's open it up, and uh, I can see one hand here, and one here at the front. Uh, hello, thank you very much for your talk. It's a pleasure to meet you, Antonio Patriota. My name is Ali Rocha. I'm a journalist, British Brazilian and human rights activist. We've been we've got a group called Brazil Matters. We've been actively campaigning against Bolsonaro during these last four years. And we were so happy when Lula won uh, for the first time in 20 years that the PT, the Workers' Party, won in the UK. Uh, with you know the the green the environmental agenda, one thing that really worries us is the opening up of the Amazon basin for oil exploration. So we have, you know, all the the green discourse promises made during the campaign and at COP 22, 23, but then on the other hand, it's opening up to exploration and we know that that's disastrous. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing is the wide alliance that was made in order to win the election we know that uh, he's sleeping with the enemies. You know, lots of the people that he's allied with are people who stopped him, him, Juma, who removed Juma from, from government in the past. And, you know, it's it's a very dangerous, uh, very dangerous alliances that he has made. And we know that also in order to govern a president, the power of a president in a in a... Uh, 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 con congressional government uh, is, is very small and the majority of the Congress is still uh, far right and Bolsonaro supporters and allies. So how, so there's two questions. First, uh, exploration of, of oil in the Amazon basin. And second, you know, how, how much do you give these alliances, what are the prices, the real price that we have to pay and how much will Lula really be able to forward his agenda in this Congress? Thanks. Okay, thank you. 
Okay, let's take another question here at the front. And if I can ask you just to say also who you are, uh, that would be great. And then we'll take one other question mark at the end of the intervention. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Lucima Prata. I'm from Brazil. And my question is related to Lula's speech, the one you mentioned. He also mentioned in the speech that Brazil would bring um, this new challenge to face, which will be the combat to the racism. And in this speech, he also mentioned the protection to indigenous people and some other minorities like the Quilombolas in Brazil. And so basically the speech is about environment and how Brazil is developing their uh, these new policies to environment and international um, relations related to this. But what came it, came out in my mind is how is how he wants to address the connection between the protection of indigenous people, for example, and the climate change. Because as I could see in the last uh, years and how you know, those uh, peoples are being very highly affected and they are very unprotected. So this is a question that I, of course I can see some, some speeds of him trying to explain a little bit, but I never really uh, uh, understood very well this. And yeah, and how do you think the, inter the international community um, somehow can help us to help Brazil achieve this, this goal, this another goal, which would be the facing of racism and the protection of those communities. Okay, thank you. And we have one over here. Ambassador, um, my name is Johnny Welsh. I'm a student of international development here at Sussex. Um, you rightly highlighted the expertise Brazil has in diplomacy. And I'd like to ask you about how difficult is this balancing act you're having to do between China and the United States? Uh, on the one hand, both are very big investors in your country. Um, but on the other hand, um, perhaps the Americans consider because of BRICS and perhaps because of the motion for the G20 to look at reforming the institutions, the financial institutions based in the United States usually, that they might consider that you're moving more towards the Chinese rather than the Americans. And perhaps um, some people might consider that slightly anti-Western in the stance. Great, thank you. And Gary, can we have a, a question perhaps from the... On those who are yep. So, um, what are your what are your views on the lack of commitments funding for the loss and damage fund? When and by whom will these gaps be filled? One more. One more. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yes, and then we'll, we'll definitely get. Um, the ambassador spoke about the need to update multilateral agencies to make them more effective and inclusive, so they work for all. He mentioned awareness of this need, a global coalition of the willing to reform, and so on. What would be one key element to make this reform significantly move forward in the face of strong positioning from some quarters? That's a diverse set of, uh, yes, it's very diverse. So this can take us into a long conversation, <laughs> but uh, so many topics were raised. Um, the first question um, deals with uh, the dynamics uh, between let's say the more environmentally minded um, sides of uh, a society and government and those uh, who are more geared towards um, e economic benefit, perhaps. Um, I am convinced that in every, mm, every society, this dialectic can be observed, including here in the United Kingdom, for example. You know, what is the role of North uh, Sea oil? Mm -hmm is to play and uh, how quickly uh, do you reach net zero? I think uh, the current government has just introduced some um, new uh, targets that would uh, lead the UK 
less quickly towards towards some of these objectives. So, and this because of the domestic political forces uh, that are not aligned exclusively in one direction or the other. So uh, Brazil is no different in this respect. And um, I think um, it is um, uh, something that, that can be admitted publicly that even within the government, um, a consensus is not easy to be reached. So uh, when you look at Marina Silva, who is the Minister for the Environment, someone who grew up in the Amazon and who has been a militant all her life, uh, extremely vocal in protecting biodiversity, the forests, the, the, uh, and developing environmentally sound policies. She is a very strong uh, member of government. But there are other interests. Um, and uh, mm, uh, there is a notion among those who defend the oil exploration in the mouth of the Amazon that this can be done in a way that is minimally damaging to the environment, but that will um, in return bring very significant uh, resources to the Brazilian economy, which can be channeled into uh, policies that will preserve the environment. So um, I'm just trying to uh, illustrate what the reasoning is on both sides uh, and recognize, uh, which perhaps uh, is less than a full answer, but an acceptance that this is a valid question, recognize that there is no consensus at present uh, at how exactly to find, uh, let's say, the, the rounding of Quadratura uh, do Circo. Uh, when you try to reconcile, you know, a square and a circle. How do you say this in English? Square, second, round hole. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so valid question, a valid challenge, uh, not a specifically Brazilian challenge. I think it's an international one and that you will see present in many, in many different uh, governments, governments uh, um, struggling, struggling with the right answer. Uh, and again, what I can say that gives Brazil a certain lead in these debates is the fact that our energy matrix is already cleaner than the average energy matrix. Our contribution to global warming is uh, around 1% uh, internationally. And uh, uh, we can uh, reduce uh, our uh, carbon footprint in a relatively simple way by curtailing deforestation. Uh, not every country has that... Um, advantage. Uh, so, you know, with sound policies in this direction, we can make progress. Regarding the alliances, again, it's a valid question. I don't have a definite answer. Um, what I can say is that I find a leader like President Lula, but um, there are many other examples historically in the present or in the past, who um, uh, makes an effort to reach out to those who think differently and who come from other political families uh, through dialogue, through uh, a genuine attempt at finding common ground, is a good recipe for um, advancing uh, the health of the democracy. Uh, the, the alternative would be to kind of cloak yourself around very rigid beliefs and uh, strict ideological uh, principles and um, and, and close yourself up and, and do not uh, uh, achieve um, the kind of uh, consensus and cooperation that is necessary to move agendas ahead. I think the alliances may look a little bit uh, risky uh, uh, from one perspective, if they include uh, politicians that in the past have embraced uh, ideals that are less than fully democratic or less than fully committed to uh, social programs or environmental sustainability. But at the same time, if you, through dialogue and through um, uh, the open channel towards uh, these representatives, um, manage to generate a consensus that will benefit society and reduce tension, I think there's something to be said for this effort. Um, it's very telling that um, President Lula in um, establishing the strategy for his last electoral campaign, reached out to a politician who was one of his opponents, uh, the vice president, Geraldo Alckmin, was governor of Sao Paulo, someone from a much more conservative uh, mindset, um, economically, ideologically, 
uh, et cetera, but um, who was instrumental, I think, in allowing for his victory and was behaved ever since uh, Lula was elected in a very constructive, democratic, um, and um, open-minded, reasonable manner, a rational manner. So, so this is a good example, I believe, in uh, uh, the benefits of reaching out to um, politicians that uh, otherwise would uh, remain in a different camp. But you could also find arguments <laughs> to prove the, the opposite theory. Um, the second question, I, I like your intervention very much because it allows me to um, refer to something Lula said at the UN General Assembly, which was that Brazil was adopting on a voluntary basis an 18th sustainable development goal to eliminate racism from Brazilian society. Now, you know, historically, Brazil is seen as a comparatively less racist society than, for example, the United States. We never, once slavery was abolished in Brazil, we never reintroduced um, apartheid type uh, legislation or uh, as you had in the southern United States, for example, until the 1960s. So, okay, in comparative terms, more um, inclusive. But there is also a growing awareness that uh, the poorest segments of the population or the people with the darker skin. Um, if you look at Brazilian diplomats, for example, um, mostly white, um, predominance of male, there are only about 22% female diplomats, it's a small percentage worldwide. Um, so a definite uh, effort has to be made to um, offer equal opportunity and to um, deal with this asymmetry. Uh, so the fact that there is a deliberate attempt to do this, I think is new um, in Brazil. Uh, I often point to the fact that today, Brazil has four ministries dedicated to what you could consider human rights agenda. So a ministry for racial equality, a ministry for gender equality, a ministry for indigenous people. You were mentioning the, the, the importance of it. This is a big breakthrough in Brazil because until recently, um, I would even venture to say that even during the first two Lula governments, there was a sense that, oh, this is a kind of a headache, but uh, we're not gonna, uh, deal with the institutional arrangements in any uh, very uh, drastic way and just you know try to make progress the way and and, uh, and uh, by contrast the new awareness is that unless you have a structure that deals with indigenous challenges very specifically there the situation of um, this population which is growing significantly more than one million people today uh, will not improve so the fact that there is a ministry, and that the minister is an indigenous person herself, uh, Sonia Guajajara, who visited uh, London recently um, and uh, had, a, I think, a very um, positive and successful series of uh, encounters, including an attracting philo philanthropic um, resources for specific projects that protect the indigenous population. This is a very big step in the in the right direction that I think should not be underestimated. Um, yeah, you mentioned the interaction and the intersection between indigenous, um, the, the status of indigenous people and climate change and uh, the, the, the threat uh, to the uh, environment uh, in many of the, the, the places in the Amazon region in particular, but others also where agricultural interests are encroaching on their lands. So I think a very important step forward was taken when uh, the government organized a summit of the presidents of the Amazon region. Um, you may have followed this last year, I think around July, August. And um, not only did the leaders come together for the first time in many years, um, this organization has existed, but uh, was uh, dormant or inoperative for a number of years. Uh, so they came together. There's a growing awareness that the Amazon is a kind of uh, common heritage uh, that uh, that all the countries uh, uh, that have a, a portion of, of, of the rainforest need to operate. But interestingly, also, there was a social summit that preceded the governmental one. And this social summit brought together many leaders uh, from indigenous groups, not only in Brazil, but Venezuela, Colombia, the Guyanas, Ecuador, Peru, 
I believe Bolivia also has a northern part of the country. Um, and they um, they met, they did, had discussions, uh, reached some conclusions, and uh, a document was presented to the governmental segment of the meeting. So, you know, this may seem like a small step, but it's important, it's symbolic, but it's also uh, unprecedented and points in a, in a good direction. So there's some good news uh, regarding the question you asked. Um, on uh, US and China, it's a complex uh, situation. Uh, again, I, I believe that Brazil is not only the only country confronting uh, a, an international geopolitical environment where you have two very powerful economy, economies and um, military powers. Um, and um, in the case of Brazil, um, we are not anti anyone, uh, anti Western or anti Chinese or anti uh, whoever it is. I mean, that doesn't mean we approve of the po policies uh, that our partners undertake. Um, sometimes people ask me, oh, how can Brazil continue speaking to the Russians after what they did in Ukraine? Well, we continued speaking to the Americans after what they did in Iraq, for example, even though we were very much against uh, the invasion and the results of the intervention are there to speak for themselves, a complete disaster. Uh, I don't think Iraq will get back on the, its feet uh, you know, as, a, as a stable, unified country within the foreseeable future. So um, engaging in dialogue does not mean approval of policy. I think it it represents a desire to keep channels open um, and also an awareness that the alternative is worse, uh, interrupting uh, the conversation. And, and it, it, in fact, it encourages more extremism uh, in, in, in most situations. Um, but I'll give you an example of, um, of the complexity of, of this, um, let's say, uh, new new <laughs> political uh, environment where China and the U.S. are very major actors. I would say not the only major actors, because if you take the European Union, for example, economically, they're a powerhouse. Um, uh, a country like the United Kingdom has tremendous uh, economic and intellectual assets and uh, technological advances that are uh, of significance. Uh, India is emerging as a very strong economy also and a, a source of of knowledge and progress in many different ways. So there are elements of multipolarity and bipolarity. Uh, sometimes I find that the easiest way to describe the current international environment is simply to say it's post-unipolar, because I think on that everybody can agree. It's no longer unipolar. And uh, the instability that this generates is part of the sense of insecurity that we have today, because we don't have the exact terminology to describe what's going on. Um, my preference is to say the following. This is going to be a slightly long answer, but but it's an opportunity also to share some of my personal thoughts with you. Uh, I believe that if you look at um, the military side of things, uh, you probably have three main actors today, three determinant actors, which are United States, NATO, let's say broadly speaking, the West, Russia, and China. Russia sitting on the biggest stockpile of nuclear weapons in China, uh, a very significant player, although it has a military budget, which is about one fourth that of the United States. So um, a lot is said about the Chinese emergence as a military power, still comparatively smaller than the US. If you look at the economic side of things, you could argue that, let's say, the G20 countries are, are influential internationally. They make up about 80% of the world economy. So that includes most of the European Union, including a representative from the European Commission in the, in the G20, as well as some of the so-called emerging uh, economies, India, Brazil, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, Australia, Canada, et cetera. But when it comes to the diplomatic influence that a country can wield, um, I think it's a much more fragmented and uh, uh, difficult to define uh, situation. And even a very small country or comparatively small country can have a global footprint and exercise influence internationally. An example sometimes I give is Norway, you know, a country of what, four or five million people, um, hands out a Nobel Peace Prize that everybody respects and uh, aspires to obtain someday. 
Uh, and that it plays a role in the Colombian conflict. In the past, they achieved very significant progress with Israel-Palestine. Now it's completely uh, fallen by the wayside, but still, you know, a very valid attempt and has, um, um, let's say, a, a, an international profile uh, of uh, a strong engagement with the multilateral system. Uh, so likewise, I believe that um, in terms of uh, diplomacy, Brazil has demonstrated that it can engage um, in a global uh, way, uh, bilaterally or th through the UN system, through the multilateral institutions, in ways that um, that shape outcomes uh, and that can help to orient uh, the discussion. Why do I mention this? Because within the multilateral system, we don't always obtain the kind of support we would like to from China, uh, for instance. So China is actually very resistant to the idea of an expanded Security Council with new permanent members, as you're probably aware. Um, whenever the BRICS meet and uh, we try to negotiate a paragraph that encourages the UN system to expand the UN Security Council with new permanent members, and within the BRICS, there are three kind of obvious candidates, Brazil, India, South Africa. You have very, very strong Chinese resistance and the language ends up being very diluted, saying something like, we encourage developing countries to take a more active role within the multilateral system. So whereas China is Brazil's number one trading partner, we have a huge surplus in trade with the Chinese. It's 100 billion US dollars two-way trade with 40 billion surplus for Brazil. The US remains uh, a major investor in Brazil, um, above, way above uh, Chinese investment. And the US is more supportive of Brazil, for example, in this precise um, arena of the Security Council uh, reform debate. So what this illustrates uh, to me is the fact that um, one needs to engage globally, um, associate oneself uh, when possible with like-minded countries in order to advance certain agendas, but uh, recognize that uh, uh, the, your partners in these mm, like-minded groups uh, will change depending on the subject. So uh, if you look at the voting patterns that Brazil has demonstrated, for example, um, we are much more likely to vote like a Western country in the Human Rights Council upholding human rights or LGBT rights uh, and the like than many other countries in the global south. So in other areas, we will tend to side with um, developing countries, for example, when it comes to uh, defending concepts like special differential treatment within the WTO or the CBDR concept within the, the environmental discussions, you know, the common but differentiated uh, responsibilities. Sorry for the long answer, but you know this uh, allowed me to <laughs> kind of make my little commercial about my own ideas. Uh, then we have um, something very specific about loss and damage fund that was um, that was channeled here. Uh, what I can say is that uh, as a president of the G20, Brazil uh, is focusing on three priorities, but two important task forces. One of them is on um, uh, addressing hunger and poverty worldwide. Uh, but the other is on um, obtaining improved uh, access to financial resources for uh, developing countries uh, within this debate uh, on uh, climate change and uh, global warming. Um, so this is an area where we would like to see um, uh, a greater readiness on the multilateral development banks, the international financial institutions, uh, individual countries from the North um, in responding more generously and actually before they demonstrate any generosity, living up to their commitments, you know, the $100 billion, et cetera, which today is considered, largely considered insufficient to tackle these, these challenges. But uh, the fact that uh, agreement was reached in Dubai on the uh, constitution of the loss and damage fund, I think is a step forward. And now the next step would be ensuring that these resources are available. In fact, not only for loss and damage, but also for mitigation, adaptation, and uh, debt relief in general. I mean, a country that has, like Sri Lanka, you know, a tremendous um, debt problem. 
how can it allocate resources to deal with um, priorities like education, health, et cetera, and, and deal with climate at, at the same time? So this is one one of the points where we will be will be focusing. I'm not sure I understood the last question. So maybe you can repeat it. Um, the ambassador spoke about the need to update multilat multilateral agencies to make them more effective and inclusive so they work for all. He mentioned awareness of, his, of this need, a global, co a global coalition of the willing to reform and so on. What would be one key element to make this reform significantly move forward in the face of strong posi positioning from some quarters? Right. Um, well, let's try to look at a uh, specific example. Um, I've mentioned here Security Council reform once or twice. Uh, one of the mm, strategies, or let's say the, the lines of action that Brazil is looking into uh, is trying to mm, promote the idea that if we not do not reform the Security Council, now that there is a widespread uh, sense that it is not functioning satisfactorily, some will say it's completely dysfunctional, um, we run the risk of um, being passive observers of such an erosion of international cooperation in the key areas, such as peace and security, that future generations will not forgive the current uh, governments or diplomats, for that matter, uh, who are uh, currently on duty. So a very strong push will be made next week at the uh, foreign minister's um, G20 meeting in Rio, my hometown in Brazil, uh, to raise awareness uh, regarding the opportunity afforded by the summit of the future. And then a subsequent meeting of G20 foreign ministers is being foreseen for the summit of the future itself in New York um, in the presence of the wider UN membership. So oh, this is Jewett, G20 plus everyone else, uh, but with a G20, let's say, uh, meeting as, as uh, 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 the key uh, or the, the main coalition in that case. And the idea will be to open a discussion, including on the on the possibility of convening a review conference of the UN Charter. For those of you who study multilateralism and are familiar with UN Charter, there's an article 109 uh, that was included there by the, by the original negotiators that foresees the possibility of a review conference, just as in a domestic environment, many countries have, um, gone through, including Brazil, but now Chile, for example, unsuccessfully tried to uh, uh, reopen their constitution in order to amend certain aspects. Well, this could be done also uh, in the multilateral sphere. And the idea would be to foresee a very limited mandate for this review conference. So looking at Security Council uh, reform, uh, eliminating the obsolete um, provisions of the charter, and maybe um, considering the incorporation of uh, some aspects that were not foreseen in 1945. So for example, the UN Charter in its preamble says nothing about the environment, says nothing about our collective responsibility regarding planet Earth. I think this would be a very uh, desirable and welcome addition that probably not that controversial. Um, and then again, uh, looking at how to map out international cooperation, disciplines, um, eventually rights and obligations when it comes to new areas like international uh, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and, and the like, and, and such matters. So I guess this answers, how would you, how would you go about? Now, um, it's not obvious that we will succeed in mobilizing the necessary um, support, but I think one strong element in our, uh, in, in our efforts and in, in, in our arguments in this regard will be uh, the alternative is very problematic and risky, not reforming. Um, this happens domestically uh, when countries don't tackle certain challenges that are kind of uh, threatening to undermine society and uh, in general. And I think it could happen internationally also. We don't want the UN to go down the way of the League of Nations, for example. I've been reading here and there some uh, observers and specialists who are, who are uh, drawing up that example. So 
a sense of crisis could motivate uh, the necessary impulse to start um, moving in the right direction, but still remains to be seen whether we will succeed. Thank, Thank you so much for all the questions. There. Thanks. We've, we've time for a couple more. And if I could ask you to be brief, because uh, obviously time is, is running out. So there's a hand here. Hello, uh, my name is Majid and I study here. Uh, my question is, uh, so since this talk is about uh, Brazil's priorities for tackling global challenges, and I've been following Brazil's stand on Israel-Gaza war, and and as we are all aware that it has killed thousands of lives, and there's a lot of destruction of infrastructure, and it has also impacted the global trade. So uh, I wanted to know, uh, is this going to be on a, on your G20 summit agenda in November? And how do you personally look at it? Or how does, like there are statements from Brazil's uh, even president about the Gaza award, but what's the actual, what are the things happening in your office? Because we don't get to meet ambassadors every day. So thank you. Thanks, there's, there's one here. Hi, uh, I'm Dolores. I'm a doctoral student here in global, not here, but in global studies. And uh, I'm also Brazilian and uh, I wear the hat. Uh, I mean, I'm, I also work for the Brazilian government in Metro. I want to leave of absence. Um, and I have two questions. Um, one question regards the paradigm of the Agenda 2030 which is based on the growth paradigm. So I wanted to know your uh, opinion on this uh, because there's a lot of criticism regarding the limits of this paradigm. And the second one relates to, the, to what you mentioned in the end of your speech about the investments in, in, in war and uh, military uh, from different countries and uh, the the focus of Brazil on democracy and peace, and how it it seems that you know President Lula is kind of a bit uh, alone in this speech in the current circumstances. Um, so yeah, I um, that's yep. it. I would love to take more. I know there's a lot of questions. I just have to take a last one here. I'm sorry for not, uh, but I think afterwards there'll be an opportunity also to. Have some conversations just informally uh, because we are due to finish in, in just five minutes. Yeah. And thank you very much for the lecture. And for my name is Damilola. I'm from Nigeria, a student of entrepreneurship and innovation. So I got one of the priorities is um, hunger, poverty, and inequality. I just want you to probably state one scheme. That could that has been done by the government. Yeah, I understand. You said you had the 18th amendment to the SDG um, addition for Brazil, and um, you had special um, um, ministries for certain. But then, are there particular schemes like for the farmers and the inclusion of women, for instance, that has success that has been successful in bridging the gap for hunger? poverty and inequality that the global south could also learn from. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, a lot to be said about all these issues again. Um, and, um, and I think everyone will understand that yeah. your responses on these ones will have to be fairly brief. I'll be brief. On Israel-Gaza, I'd start by saying that President Lula at this very moment is in Cairo addressing the Arab League at summit level. And I'm sure he is making a very strong statement uh, in defense of an immediate ceasefire. Um, also, uh, that will come with the freedom of the hostages and um, a strong push for negotiations for a viable Palestinian state, two-state solution, and an end to the fighting. Um, Brazil has supported the South African motion at the International Court of Justice, um, as you are aware. And... Uh, uh, we are also supporting a full membership for Palestine at the United Nations. So, whereas we enjoy, historically, we have enjoyed good relations with the Arab world and with Israel, I think we have condemned in no uncertain terms both the attack by Hamas 
but also the disproportionate retaliation by Israel, which is um, under any uh, consideration tantamount to a massacre of civilians. I mean, it's difficult to find the terminology to describe what's going on. And the sense of indignation in Brazilian society, you can believe that is very, very strong. And President Lula was in Cairo today also meeting with President Sisi. He gave a, um, a statement to the press where he was very, very forceful on this topic. Um, whether this will enter into the G20 agenda. Now, I would recall that uh, the G20 was primarily conceived as a platform for economic trade, to some extent, um, energy and uh, environmental uh, considerations to the, to the extent that they in influence the economy, uh, but not primarily as a, a, a locus for political uh, topics. It's not easy to completely dissociate one agenda from the other. And of course, situations like Russia and its economic impact as well as now Israel Gaza, which also, for example, is affecting the um, Suez Canal very significantly. So uh, Egypt not only paying a price for the uh, rise in in the in uh, wheat exports, uh, mm -hmm. the price of the biggest wheat importer in the world, paying a high price for Russia Ukraine war, and now for the Gaza situation due to reduced uh, incomes and royalties at Suez Canal. But independently from the economic considerations, I think there. There is a debate to be had, but also an effort to be made not to allow divergences in this respect to contaminate all the rest. Uh, we need to focus on what is the predominant agenda for the G20 and pursue these other agendas in the appropriate fora, which would be United Nations, Human Rights Council, International Court of Justice, etc. In fact, we also support uh, a review conference of the Geneva Conventions on Humanitarian Law because very obviously there's a need to better define what is the right to self-defense. The right to self-defense is not a blank check for you to exterminate people, civilians, women, children, the way it's happening right now. Um, the paradigm question, 2030, I'm not sure I agree. Um, I actually believe that um, the Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda represented a very welcome paradigm shift from the Washington consensus. Um, uh, I'm not the only one to say this. Uh, economists like Jeffrey Sachs, um, whom I consider a good friend, uh, he would often point out when we had the Rio conference in, 12, in 2012 that you, know, you have just buried the Washington consensus, which consisted in trying to sell the idea that through economic growth, you would um, produce uh, social benefits and environmental uh, responsibility that would deal with those challenges. Uh, whereas experience demonstrated this was not the case. So to uh, replace this consensus with a new one that um, is based on three pillars, social, environmental, economic, uh, as equally important in uh, providing a, a, a safe uh, path to sustainability, I believe is progress. Um, whether we need further progress at some point uh, to refine these ideas, you know, this is up to the younger generation perhaps, but I find that for the time being, um, uh, implementing this new paradigm and um, focusing on the achievement of the goals would be, would represent tremendous progress internationally. Unfortunately, we have been backtracking, and on many of the, the goals, you know, rather than progress, what we see is uh, the opposite. Um, you mentioned military expenditures and the fact that President Lula is quite alone in, in pointing this out. I think you're absolutely correct. He is alone in terms of world leaders, but this is where I um, find that um, youth groups, academics, NGOs, and others uh, can be a very important auxiliary force. And, I personally defend the idea that, you know, um, in addition to this very strong civil society participation in the COPs, uh, Dubai, Shanghai, Sheikh, et cetera, have witnessed uh, extraordinary participation from all groups. I think we need also the same mobilization for peace and against um, these distortions 
in the priorities of governments that are you know, among the most developed in the world, but that seem to be uh, ready to disimburse money in order to produce weapons or to purchase them or to sell them, but very reluctant to uh, fulfill their commitments when it comes to the environment, uh, whereas both uh, place us under threat, uh, uh, but the money is being placed in the wrong position. So, so I would encourage all of you to raise your voices in this respect so that we will not be so alone in the future. <laughs> Those were the questions I took down. Uh, there was one here also from a Nigerian colleague, which was... I, th I think it was understanding. Maybe just very quickly, you can so just... Talking about schemes that have been... So looking at the rural farmers, for instance, what schemes have you done oh, to the schemes, empower yes, them? So yeah, the inequality you know, and all of that. There have been many policies in Brazil that have uh, inspired similar, uh, similar uh, governmental um, projects in, in developing countries. Uh, when I served in Egypt, for example, I was surprised to learn that the Bolsa Familia uh, system of uh, uh, cash transfers to poor families under certain conditions and you know, observing local characteristics. For example, in Brazil, they were very effective because it was done through the female head of family. Uh, this was something that sociologists, but also Lula through his own personal life experience um, came to the conclusion that uh, in Brazil, as perhaps in many parts of the world, the woman is more responsible than the man. Uh, when it comes to um, administering scant resources for food, for livelihood, for medicine, for education, et cetera. So that was one of the keys of the success, as well as um, requiring uh, that only those families who um, uh, made sure that the children were enlisted in school uh, and received certain vaccines, for example, would be entitled to, re to receive the, the benefit. So in Egypt, a very similar project uh, was adopted for rural families in the southern part of the country, not nationwide. And I understand that in some other countries as well. Now, some of these projects were discontinued or you know, given less importance during the previous government and now are being um, taken up again with um, improvements wherever possible. Um, but there would be uh, uh, other other strategies that I think can be implemented, for example, to aid uh, the small scale farmer um, and by uh, guaranteeing a price for the produce, um, establishing uh, cooperatives uh, whereby the produce will be bought and by the government and uh, made available to the schools in the uh, rural areas. So not only do you deal with the hunger uh, situation and by, by feeding the, the disadvantaged groups in the public schools, but also you uh, ensure that the livelihood of these families is a little more predictable. There are other, other areas that uh, where, where some um, ideas are being tested. Um, there's a very strong ministry. Oh yes, I remember you mentioned uh, that I said there was a ministry for racial equality, gender equality. Well, there's a very strong and significant ministry for social development. The minister, Wellington Dias, was a former governor of a state in Brazil called Piauí. Uh, my Brazilian colleagues will know that Piauí is often known for a very low per capita income, poverty, and yet through uh, very um, uh, progressive policies, it has demonstrated extraordinary results in education and in reduction of poverty. So it, it demonstrates that um, you can be comparatively poor, but um, uh, actually effective in implementing policies. And, and I think the same could apply in other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. <laughs> Well, let me just thank everyone. I, I don't think anybody would be grateful for me trying to summarize or synthesize what's been, uh, what's been contributed today because it's an amazing range. I mean, I think some of the issues that you've 
talked about you know this idea of a post unipolar world i think what you've described is a world full of complexity uncertainty it aligns very much with some of the conversations we're having here at ids around a recasting of development and and trying to reimagine alternative ways of understanding this collective uh, process we're involved in um you know you've encouraged us to think of cooperation no salvation without cooperation mm -hmm. is perhaps a, a you know a bit of a banner that we can take away today and we're looking forward very much I, I have the patent to that. You have the patent to that. Okay, <laughs> so uh, trademark. Uh, and, um, you know, we're really looking forward in this coming year from IDS uh, with colleagues and, you know, with many others who we will be, you know, collectively engaging with to be involved in this exciting opportunity through the T20 to participate in these debates which are contributing to the deliberations of the G20. So, yeah. you know, I think you've really helped us understand both some of the, the big macro issues, institutional pictures, some histories that you shared with us, some personal also today, mm -hmm. and also some, you know, some, some fascinating detail into what is actually happening in terms of Brazilian approaches to policies, schemes and systems, ways in which are, are grappling with, with real challenges, which don't always have straightforward answers and are very often contested. So I think yeah. it's been a, a great session. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it oh, as much as I, I certainly did. And I enjoyed this morning and a lot of other things I have to do. Great. Thank you. Thank you.